Road graders and plows were called in to move tons of mud and debris off the highway. Many people expected there would be slide problems, but perhaps not this soon. And certainly one of the questions uh, that's going to be asked now is this sort of thing going to happen every time it rains? A geologist has been up in the air looking, uh, looking at Storm King Mountain. He's now predicting that uh, the highway will be reopened in the next four or five hours, uh, perhaps as early as early afternoon. Christina, back to you. All right, Dan Dennison, thanks for your report west of Glenwood Springs. A check on what... Update. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gary Shapiro. In the news today, Glenwood Springs gets hit again. In July, it was wildfires. Last night, enormous mudslides hit fast and without warning. Right now, I-70 is still closed. The slides trapped dozens of vehicles, injured two people just west of Glenwood Springs. Western Slope correspondent Dan Dennison was on the scene moments after the slide. It happened without warning around 10:15 Thursday night. Several mudslides carrying boulders, trees, and tons of silt created by the fire swept across all four lanes of Interstate 70. Hey, it was difficult to see because you tried to concentrate on one. That's your own. Uh, there was a family with uh, the black people with two kids. I got them out of the car. I got them out towards the east. They seemed to be okay. In which car were they? In one of those three. The right one. The slide swept his car and two others traveling west on I-70 down a steep hill and onto the eastbound lanes. One of the other drivers was then swept from her car and nearly into the Colorado River. Three Denver Hospital emergency room nurses came to her rescue. I would say at least 200 feet down an embankment almost into the river. Rescue crews cut brush in order to reach the 28-year-old driver. They used ropes to keep from sliding into the river themselves and to lift the victim to safety plows and loaders cleared a rough path for them so they could get her to an ambulance. <laughs> Miraculously, only one other person was injured in the slide. 20-year-old Kevin White of Glenwood Springs has a fractured jaw. It rained most of the night in Glenwood Springs, and with so much loose soil still on Storm King Mountain, the danger of further slides is a real threat. The cleanup on I-70 now into its 10th hour, it's expected to last at least another four or five. And the skies over Glenwood Springs this morning, partly cloudy, many people hoping no more rain because there's still plenty of debris and soil up on Storm King Mountain. Near Glenwood Springs, Dan Dennison, 9 News. Thank you, Dan. You can still get to Glenwood Springs from Denver, but I-70 is closed just west of the city near mile marker 1. Colorado's news leader. You're watching Nine News at Noon with Gary Shapiro, Sherry Sellers, and meteorologist Bill Custer. What a job in the mountains as bulldozers worked to clear a mountain of mud that slid down onto I-70 last night. The after effects of the storm King Mountain Fire are still troubling Glenwood Springs today. Hello, everyone. I'm Sherry Sellers. And I'm Gary Shapiro. Thanks for joining us. The Glenwood mudslide happened just after 10 last night. Now, more than 12 hours later, they're still trying to get it all cleaned up. It happened just below the spot where the fire on Storm King Mountain killed 14 firefighters in July. Heavy rain forced loose a big chunk of the mountain, resulting in a mucky mess six feet deep that landed on drivers on I-70. Dan Dennison is there now. He's been covering the story all night long. How's the cleanup going, Dan? Well, Gary, Sherry, as you mentioned, this massive cleanup has been underway for the better part of 13 hours now. Mudslides swept onto I-70 in several different places west of Glenwood Springs overnight, all borne by uh, some very extremely heavy rains that uh, soaked loose soils up on Storm King Mountain. There were three major slides, including this one at exit 110, uh, about six miles west of Glenwood Springs at Canyon Creek, and there were numerous small ones. Virtually every drainage coming off Storm King Mountain carried a witch's brew of mud, rock, and wood. It happened without warning around 10.15 Thursday night. Several mudslides carrying boulders, trees, and tons of silt created by the fire swept across all four lanes of Interstate 70. Hey, it was difficult to see because you tried to concentrate on one. That's your own. Uh, there was a family with uh, the black people with two kids. I got them out of the car. I got them out towards the east. They seem to be okay. In which car were they? In one of those three. The right one. The slide swept his car and two others traveling west on I-70 down a steep hill and onto the eastbound lanes. 
One of the other drivers was then swept from her car and nearly into the Colorado River. Three Denver Hospital emergency room nurses came to her rescue. I would say at least 200 feet down an embankment, almost into the river. Rescue crews cut brush in order to reach the 28-year-old driver. They used ropes to keep from sliding into the river themselves and to lift the victim to safety. Plows and loaders cleared a rough path for them so they could get her to an ambulance. Miraculously, only one other person was injured in the slide. 20-year-old Kevin White of Glenwood Springs has a fractured jaw. It rained most of the night in Glenwood Springs, and with so much loose soil still on Storm King Mountain, the danger of further slides is a real threat. John Smith is a uh, maintenance superintendent with the Colorado Department of Transportation. John, did anyone really anticipate this sort of thing happening uh, this fall anyway? No, we didn't expect cloudbursts. Uh, rain and, and the runoff, we're expecting some debris to be coming down and, and mudslides, but not the, to the extent we have right here. Now, are we going to see this happen every time we get a, a steady rain here in the Glenwood Springs area? I'm hoping not. Uh, cloudbursts, I think, is the main problem. If we will have mud. Uh, we'll have problems on all our drainage areas until this is receded. Now, take it one of the perhaps the good things about this one is it alleviated a, a lot of the uh, pressure you may see in the future in terms of it, it brought down a lot of the, the big debris because there was just so much rain and, and mud and debris last night. We got, I think we got all the dead trees and majority of the large rocks in the, in the canyon right now. As you can see on the guardrail, it took the guardrail and everything out, so it was quite a force. I think we got the majority of that. Your folks have been at it for uh, better than, than 12 hours now. What's your prediction in terms of when they'll get I-70 or at least part of I-70 reopened? We're shooting for 3 o'clock for one lane uh, traffic each direction. Um, we'll have one lane going down, and that's in order to keep the speeds down and make sure that it's safely through the areas yeah, we worked gotcha. in. In the Colorado Mountains, you folks deal with all varieties of natural uh, calamities, avalanches, and, and boulders, and, and things of, of that nature. Have you seen a mudslide uh, quite this enormous or, or quite this extensive in, in your career? Uh, yeah, the McClure Pass and Douglas Pass, we have them pretty good on those. So at least we're going to have this and open within a day. Okay, very good. John Smith of the Colorado Department of Transportation predicting that at least uh, part of I-70 should be reopened by 3 o'clock this afternoon. And certainly, Gary and Sherry, that's good news for folks that uh, were planning to head west for their Labor Day holiday. Back to you now. You know, Boy, a then. lot of people are mm. listening. Yes. That's for sure. You Thank look you. at that stuff you shot last night, by the way, which was very good stuff. I know you were up late doing that. It is amazing. No one was killed. It's truly amazing that no one was killed, uh, particularly in the, in the case of the one lady whose car was swept uh, off of uh, westbound I-70 onto eastbound I-70, and then once her car was swept, she was swept another 200 yards out of her car down an embankment almost into the Colorado River. Fortunately, there were a lot of caring people around that uh, came to her aid very quickly, and that helped uh, make the situation a, a happy one rather than a, a potential tragedy. Mm, still terrifying, though. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Well, trying to get to Utah, as Dan said, on I-70 has been a real problem all morning. Traffic has been detoured halfway across the state. The detour goes from Walcott north to U.S. 40, then west to Craig and south to I-70. That is hundreds of miles and several hours out of the way. Again, hopefully the interstate will be reopened early this afternoon, at least one lane this afternoon about 2 or 3 o'clock. Okay. Two lanes of Interstate 70 west of Glenwood Springs reopened this afternoon. I-70 was closed for nearly 18 hours after a series of mudslides caused by heavy rain blocked the highway with tons of mud and debris. It happened just after 10 last night at the foot of Storm King Mountain, where 14 firefighters lost their lives in July. The barren slopes of the mountain simply couldn't heavy the handle downpour. Western Slope correspondent Dan Dennison was on the scene minutes after the slide happened and has this report. That's when 28-year-old Carrie Howard of Rifle was apparently swept off her feet. I would say at least 200 feet down an embankment, almost into the river. Rescuers found Howard clinging to bushes along the river. During a difficult one-hour rescue, they had to cut a path through the thick brush, dodge boulders to get a litter to her, and watch out for their own safety on the steep, slick slopes. Even after they got her up to the highway, and even after a plow had cleared a rough path for them, Putting on the way to a waiting ambulance was treacherous. Her car and the two others ended up stacked on top of one another. The other drivers got out okay, but were shaken by their ordeal. I've never had something like that happen to me. His wife was traveling in a different car, and for quite a while, he didn't know if she was okay or not. The car, it's in front of a giant tree, though. 
your wife's car? Yeah. Well, she's just fine. Though. She's just waiting for you. This is what's left of Chris's new Land Cruiser. After getting it and other stranded cars cleared from the interstate, dozens of plows and loaders began moving the heavy mud. Three wide gullies coming directly from the top of Storm King Mountain carried the brunt of it. At the bottom of one of them, a wreath for the firefighters framed the cleanup operation. In all six miles of I-70 was covered, forcing hundreds of weekend travelers to wait it out in Glenwood Springs or to make one of several lengthy detours around the mess. All right, Dan, we see you now. I was going to ask you a right question. Now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. I was just saying, Adele, that we're uh, live on Interstate 70, about six miles west of uh, Glenwood Springs. I wanted to show you another example of the force of this slide. There was a big guardrail uh, along uh, these lanes of Interstate 70, and from about this point, way, way back there, the mudslide knocked the guardrail into the river. I don't think anyone's seen it so far. And as you probably know, uh, the interstate opened about an hour and 10 minutes ago. They only have one lane open in each direction. And I imagine as soon as they get some of the dust and some of the uh, debris cleaned off the road, they'll probably try to get uh, the additional two lanes open as well. Now back to you, Adele. All right, Dan Dennison reporting from Storm King Mountain. Thanks a lot. Experts say we can expect a lot more mud and rock slides over the next few years. All the forest fires that have scorched Colorado this summer have set the stage for slides in many parts of the state. The roots of shrubs and trees help anchor the soil. When the plants die, the roots lose their grip, and the fires create another problem. It also removes the vegetation that's above the surface, which generally, when it's in place, breaks the impact of raindrops that are falling on the slope if you have a very intense rainfall. But if you remove the vegetation, all of the loose material on the slope is unprotected, so it's much more prone to failure. Professor Wool says mo much of the soil around Glenwood is unstable and slides frequently, but the fire makes the problem much worse. This has been an especially tough summer for the town of Glenwood Springs. First, the fire on Storm King Mountain, and now mudslides on the same mountain. Kim Christensen is in Glenwood Springs. She talked with several people there today, and she's joining us. Kim, how are the people there coping? Well, Paula, they're really coping very well. In fact, the only inconvenience this slide caused to them was the fact that a lot of people weren't able to get to work today because they actually don't live in the town of Glenwood Springs. And most of them, of course, are very relieved that nobody was seriously hurt in this. What we found today is the people of Glenwood Springs are very resilient. They support each other. They treat each other like family. I think any time something like this happens in a small town, you see the people rally around that. They've seen it before. Less than two months ago, this town was decorated in purple ribbons in memory of the 14 firefighters who died on Storm King Mountain, protecting the people of Glenwood. Tragedy struck nine years ago with an explosion at the Rocky Mountain Natural Gas Company. Twelve people died in the blast. Once again, this town grieved and pulled together. Residents say that's the way it's always been. Everybody does kind of lock together here, and they, they just uh, all team up together. And a little tragedy, you know, even the large one, we all try to make it as small as possible. But. And no one was too surprised. They knew Storm King was barren, and it's been a long, dry summer. Um, actually, I'm not worried. I think that Glenwood always bounces back. You know, and if it happens again, they'll just get the front loaders out again and just move it. By comparison, a little mud isn't really devastating. This town has a way of taking things in stride. They know they can't forget the past, but the memories go both ways. You know, and I just, you know, it'll be a summer that we'll all remember. But we have, you know, a lot of years that we remember with the Rocky Mountain gas explosion and, and um, different, different tragedies. But there's a lot of good things that happen here, too that we remember. We can remember a year because it was a good year. Not, we don't just remember tragedies. And of course, they can't soon forget this, though, Paula, because as you can see along the Colorado River right now, it's just mud everywhere. So they are going to have that reminder for a while. And in the meantime, they'll just learn to cope because this really has been a rough summer for all of them in Glenwood. Kim, do they think that this is going to happen again, this type of mudslide situation at that place? Well, they are pretty fearful about that. I mean, all of them talked about it. They said they all thought it was a matter of time. They didn't feel that there was anything anybody could do to protect Storm King Mountain, no barricade or anything. And frankly, they said when it, when it started to rain, it had been so dry, they thought, oh, no, they just hope it doesn't keep raining like that. They would rather have snow at this point. They think the mountain needs a lot of snow right now more than anything. But uh, they're afraid that this might happen again. All right, Kim, thank you very much. Kim Christensen from Glenwood Springs. From Colorado's news leader, Ed Sardella, 
Adele Arakawa, meteorologist Mike Nelson, Paula Woodward, and Ron Zapolo Sports. This is Nine News. A massive mudslide across part of I-70 in Glenwood Springs, the after effects of the fire on Storm King Mountain that killed 14 firefighters. Good evening, I'm Paula Woodward for Ed Sardella. And I'm Adele Arakawa. It made a mess, and it isn't back to normal quite just yet. Two lanes of Interstate 70 near Glenwood Springs reopened this afternoon. It was closed for more than 17 hours after enormous mudslides crashed down from Storm King Mountain. That's where 14 firefighters were killed last July. Dan Dennison reports two people were hurt, and there was plenty of damage and headaches. Amazingly, no one in these cars got hurt when a wall of mud swept them from one side of I-70 to the other. It just happened so fast. It's like just the whole mountain came and started sliding and <laughs> moving. The mud continued to flow, and when 28-year-old Corey Howard of Rifle got out of her wrecked car, it carried her off. I would say at least 200 feet down an embankment, almost into the river. Bystanders, including a trio of ER nurses, got to Howard first. She was clinging to a tree to keep from sliding farther down the slope and into the river. Getting help to her with knee-deep mud, slick boulders, and entire tree trunks blocking the way was no easy task. Rescue teams worked for more than an hour to clear a path to Howard to get a litter to her and to get her safely out of her predicament. She has a broken pelvis. See you, Mike. The only other injury was to one of the people who came to help her. 20-year-old Kevin White of Glenwood Springs broke his jaw. I-70 needed lots of help today. Three big mudslides and several smaller ones blocked all four lanes over a six-mile stretch. It's a slide-prone area, but more so after the July fire. There's little vegetation on Storm King Mountain, and with a heavy downpour Thursday evening, everything came rushing downhill. After an around-the-clock, all-out effort, two lanes of I-70 were reopened just after three this afternoon. During the slide, local residents thought it was strange that with so much water around, they could still smell burned wood. This log used to be black with ash. Now it's caked with mud. Near Glenwood Springs, Dan Denison, 9 News. So two lanes remain closed, one in each direction. Experts say we can expect more mud and rock slides over the next few years. All those forest fires this summer have stripped vegetation and made conditions perfect for more of the same problem. I-70 had other problems today that had nothing... Kevin White is a hero for what he did last Thursday. Kevin was one of two people caught in the mudslides near Glenwood Springs. The other victim was a woman who can't hear or speak. She credits Kevin with saving her life. Western Slope correspondent Dan Dennison talked with him today, and Dan, Kevin was hurt at the time he did this. Ed, he certainly was. This slide literally swept him off I-70 this direction, down this very uh, steep embankment and into the Colorado River behind me. He says the river was literally boiling with trees and logs and rocks, and one of the rocks hit him in the chin, and that's how he broke his uh, jaw. Kevin actually witnessed the slide happen. He witnessed other motorists uh, being trapped by the slide, and he got out to help. The mud tossed cars around like toys. Kevin White was on one end of the slide Thursday night. He saw it happen and ran to help. Before he got to these three cars stacked on top of one another, the slide knocked him off his feet. When it first knocked me down, I was just scared. I didn't know quite what to do. And then I just thought, well, if I'm going to do it, I just point my feet downhill. And if it jaffles me, it does. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. I'll just, I just kind of went with it. The mud spit him into the river, and he thinks that's when he broke his jaw. It was right when I was coming out of the slide into the river. The water was turning up a lot, and that's when the rocks were really bouncing around and the logs and whatever. And I'm sure it was a rock, because I had little chunks of rock in my chin. The current carried him to the river's bank. I just grabbed onto a big old rock, and that's when I saw Carrie, and she was only about four feet away from me. And so I just held onto that rock and kind of tried to get her to come over to me, but she couldn't hear me. Carrie is 28-year-old Carrie Howard of Rifle. She's deaf, but eventually Kevin got her attention and motioned her to the rock. She came over and we both just kind of stood there and held onto the rock and held onto each other. Hoped that it would stop raining. The rain stopped and Kevin climbed the embankment to tell others Carrie was still trapped below with possible broken bones. He believes he had a guardian angel. And some say he became Carrie's angel. It made the whole thing 
thousand times better. Because when I was by myself down there, I didn't know, you know, I was, what's the chance they're going to find one person stuck to the riverbank and all that crap, you know, screaming, going, hey, I'm down here. And down there somewhere is the rock that the two mud-covered strangers clung to until the rain stopped and Kevin was able to work his way back up the hill. He says he doesn't consider himself a hero because there were plenty of other people who got out to help. He just happened to be the one who got swept away. Ed, back to you. How long is his jaw going to stay like that? Well, he broke it in three separate places. His mouth is going to be wired shut for four to six weeks, so of course he's uh, enjoying or not enjoying a liquid diet. Uh, he's taking it all very much in stride, and I imagine that uh, Carrie Howard is very thankful for the help uh, she got from young Kevin. I'm sure she is. Well done on his part. Thanks, Dan. A Loveland man was killed. At Welcome back, everybody. You might not know this, but in Spanish, Colorado means the color red. But during the fall, Colorado says the color gold. Our state's annual display of aspen gold is underway in the high country. One of the best places to see the changing aspens is along Tennessee Pass, Highway 24 between Minturn and Leadville. That's about two hours from Denver. Dan Dennison he is our aspen sleuth today. Dan, I'm jealous. I can see the colors behind you just starting to illuminate the hillsides there. It's a beautiful day, and the aspens haven't peaked yet. And to tell you the truth, I kind of like them when they're, they're at this stage. Some of the stands are still full-on green, others a mix of green and gold, some completely yellow. And every once in a while, you'll see an orange one or red one thrown in for good measure. There's nothing quite like a leisurely drive or walk through a stand of changing aspens. I love it. Just love it. It's beautiful here. It's gorgeous. These folks drove over Tennessee Pass to take in nature's colorful transition from summer to fall. The Denverites in the group say they may have missed this treat if not for their visitors from Kansas. I'm probably up here because of them. Because, you know, when you live in Denver, you never get up here all the time. And this is one of the things they wanted to see. And that's really why we're up here. In all honesty, there are dozens, probably even hundreds of places to watch the Aspen Show. But we relied on their expertise to tell us the best place, reasonably close to Denver, for great Aspen viewing this weekend. I think up in this pass, you know, it, when you, from Denver, the leaves are starting to turn, trees are, and it's very pretty, but as you get up here, it's no comparison. Definitely up in here is the prettiest. If not this weekend, make a point to make it up to the mountains by the end of the month, and you'll see why Colorado in the fall is the envy of many a state. We have some pretty maples, as a matter of fact, some maple festivals back in Kansas and southwest Missouri, but that's red orange. This is uh, this yellow, what, yellow gold? Uh, that's something we're not uh, used to seeing, so it's an entirely different look. And if you can make it out this weekend, a very nice circle tour that you can take is to get off I-70 at Minturn, come up and over uh, Tennessee Pass to Leadville, and then return by way of Fremont Pass, which drops you back onto I-70 at Copper Mountain. And Ann, still a couple of great weekends of Aspen watching to come here in Colorado. Back to you now. Oh, that looks so pretty behind you. Thanks for that mini vacation, Dan. Straight out of the movie City Slickers, city folk paying for the chance to play cowboy. There's one huge difference here, however. This isn't a movie. In Colorado, it happens just about every day. Our Western Slope correspondent, Dan Dennison, is out on the ranch near Carbondale. He's going to tell us more about the real-life city slickers. Dan, I bet a lot of folks would pay for that true-to-life cowboy stuff. I know my father would. Oh, and they sure would. In fact, a company called Rocky Mountain Cattle Movers has been doing just that. Last summer, uh, they started business, and they entertained about 800 paying customers. This year, about 2,000 people are expected to join in. You know, I got to wondering today what the stars of the show, the cows, think of all this attention. So we followed along as 80 Longhorns entertained paying customers. Granted, we ain't the smartest creatures here on God's green earth, but, geez, what about those folks? Okay, let's see. Who's the bravest person out of this bunch? John. <laughs> Most of them come from those big cities where bravery isn't a bad thing to have, but I wonder how many of these slickers have suffered sunstroke, dust inhalation, and saddle sores all in one day and paid for it to boot. Boot? I know the regular type cowboys get a kick out of it. I think they're funny. <laughs> it's a little, it's, they have a good time, though. Everybody seems to really have a good time. They really enjoy coming out here and uh, just riding. You've heard of lean, mean driving machines? Well, nearly every day, we Longhorns walk seven miles, and the humans follow right along on their horses. 
We heard about it from the concierge at the hotel, and we also heard from Sleet Snickers, and we wanted to be one of them. Our owners say we're bred for this kind of work. Mostly, mostly we have Corrientes and some Texas Longhorn cattle. They, they're more adept at this kind of thing. Of course, none of them ever were born thinking they would ever do this. You can say that until the cows come home. Oh, that's us. We also entertain the city slickers in other ways. Why do you ride for your money? I don't know. Why do you rope for short pay? Drop it. <laughs> oh, the worst steak you've got. We even provide the grub at lunch. And just today, I wondered how the people would feel if they walked a mile or so in our hooves. I suspect they could go back and forth without us, and the truth be known. But uh, it's fun pretending that you're you're making a difference. Seriously, folks, we don't mind giving some of you a real taste of the West. Oh. I do know our bosses appreciate it too. And again, Rocky Mountain Cattle Movers of Carbondale offers uh, one day long, seven mile long, authentic cattle drives. We understand that several other cattle drive companies have popped up during the past year around the state uh, offering similar sort of trips. And even though we uh, poke some fun at City Slickers today, we're told by the City Slickers who went out on the drive today that's, uh, that it's a lot of fun. And Ann, back to you. Dan, I wonder if the real cowboys work harder at keeping the cattle in line or the City Slickers in line. How much does this so. cost? Uh, first of all, I think there's a little bit of uh, both things happening. It's $165 uh, a day. That includes lunch for adults, somewhat cheaper for kids. It looks like a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Dan Dennison reporting. If you were to ask him, what's up, Doc? It's the talk of the town in Aspen today. Four small earthquakes that shook the area Wednesday. They've come in pairs. The first two came very early Wednesday morning. The last two, between 10 and 10.30 last night. Our Western Slope correspondent, Dan Dennison, is in Aspen now with one of our mobile newsrooms. Dan, the, the quakes weren't real, too, real strong, were they? They certainly weren't, Kim. In fact, by uh, California standards, it's safe to say that the four tremblers here were pretty insignificant. The strongest, the one that uh, one of the local newspapers is calling Mr. Big, registered a whopping 3.1 on the Richter scale. It happened at 10.04 p.m. Wednesday. Then about uh, 22 minutes later, a uh, second quake registered at 2.5 on the scale. They were considering that an aftershock. Two quakes that you mentioned very early Wednesday morning, both registered between 2 and 2.5 on the scale. The million-dollar question here today, did last night's quakes topple this 30-foot pine tree? It broke about a foot above its trunk and smashed into a condominium balcony at the Prospector Lodge in downtown Aspen. Luckily, the condominium wasn't occupied, nor was the deck or hot tub on the deck. But guests in neighboring units heard the crash just after gusty winds struck the area. The strongest earth tremor happened seconds later. That's why some people here believe it was the wind and not the earthquakes that felled the tree. Well, we saw that cloud coming over the mountain, and the wind came up extremely high, and the furniture started blowing around, and. Right, and about the same time we felt the shock of the earthquake, uh, and I was standing in there on the floor when I felt it. We, we ran in and shut the doors, and then the, all the doors rattled and blew, and we were afraid it might be a tornado. So we went to crack the door, and you could hear the cr uh, crash, or a loud noise, and then the tremor. Needless to say, a very memorable night between the winds and the earthquakes for uh, many guests at Aspen's Prospector Lodge. Work crews have been here about the past half hour chopping this tree into sections so they can get it cleared off this deck. Again, many of the folks here believe that it was the wind and not the earthquakes at all that caused this tree to fall over last night. And Waverly Person at the Earthquake Information Center in Golden seems to agree with that theory. He tells us that it's very unlikely that tremors of the magnitude felt here in Aspen would cause a tree this size to topple. If uh, that's the case, the quakes caused absolutely no damage in the Aspen area, but a lot of excitement. We understand that police dispatchers logged about 300 calls, curiosity calls, between 10 and 10.30 last night. Kim, back to you. Well, Dan, this morning we talked to the Sheriff's Department. They said that a lot of people from California knew exactly what it was. Any chance of more quakes today? Well, the experts tell us there's always a chance for some uh, small aftershocks, but they really don't expect anything uh, major at all. It's just simply some ground moving here. In fact, it's a fairly common occurrence around here. Back in 1991, there were some earthquakes in the Aspen area, and I remember being uh, woken up when I lived in Carbondale about, oh, eight or nine years ago in the middle of the night, one Easter morning. We had a, a quake there. I think it was between 2.5 and 3 on the Richter scale, and it woke everyone up in town in Carbondale down valley. So really not an uncommon occurrence here, but it... Uh, Right. All right. Have a, good, have a good time this weekend. Thanks. 2,000 of the world's hottest mountain bikers are in Vail for the World Mountain Bike Championships. As Dan Dennison reports, it's full of challenges and rugged terrain.
This is a small section of the World Championship Cross Country Course. Riders race up and down the front side of Bell Mountain. Each of three loops brings them back through downtown Bell and then grunting back uphill. Oh, it's torture because you, your heart rate goes from, well, not quite so high on the downhills, and then as soon as you hit the uphill, it just skyrockets. Oh, boy, that's, that's the tough part. It's a competition that calls on a combination of strength and bike handling finesse. They climb 2,000 feet vertically and then zoom across mostly rough trails back to town. Mountain biking is a young sport, but it's become very popular for recreational riders and competitors alike. Athletes from 50 nations are in Vail this week for cross-country races, dual slaloms, and Sunday's exciting downhill. This is the fourth year of internationally sanctioned mountain bike competitions. The first world championships were held in Durango in 1990. It's a great spectator sport. People can climb up along the course to watch the action or stay in town and cheer from the sidelines and wonder what it must be like for riders like young Gene Hilton. He finished third in today's junior men's cross-country race. Small, my back was, was aching the whole time. I couldn't concentrate on much. My legs, I didn't feel that much. Just my back was bothering me. But it's life. <laughs> That's life in Vail this weekend. Dan Denison, 9 News, 4 o'clock. And good luck to them. The elementary school in Basalt near Aspen has gone to extreme heights to encourage kids to read. Western Slope correspondent Dan Dennison reports they call it the Dive into Reading program. Strike up the band. Roll out the target. What's up at Basalt Elementary? A plane. Superman. Well, not quite. Someone's got a skydive out there. The principal's husband and two other men, in fact. Whoa, that one over there is a jet, guys. It's called a Cessna 182. This high-flying stunt kicks off a year-long dive into reading program. There he goes. He's spinning around. It's beautiful here. It's beautiful skydiving in the mountains. We're more than happy to do this for the kids, too. We got two more coming in. It's a dramatic way to make these kids think about reading. Over the next six months, if they read lots, their principal, Judy Jordahl, will take the jump from 6,000 feet up. I've done skydiving before, but never into a place this small. You guys are going to have to read a lot of books. They want these youngsters to discover now that reading is a lifelong activity, that it's fun, and that it'll help them grow intellectually. Kindergartners, first, second, third, and fourth graders have accepted the Dive into Reading Challenge. Each kid is going to have to read a certain number of books each month or read for a certain number of minutes every day. If they reach their goals, their reward will come next spring when their principal will jump out of an airplane and onto the school grounds. In Basalt, Dan Denison, 9 News. The principal says he's not sure what she'll do next year if the kids reach... That's to address here or maybe the lack of good parenting in this case it's estimated deadbeat parents in this country owe custodial parents billions of dollars that's right billions in child support payments in Grand Junction there's a new company helping to track down deadbeat parents and make them pay up Western Slope correspondent Dan Dennison is there with one of our mobile newsrooms and Dan all right tell us how they track them down well, Ann, they simply use tried and true investigative techniques, along with information readily available from computer databases. From a modest office inside this building, Track X tracks down both deadbeat moms and dads. Rebecca Morick spends a lot of time at her computer searching bank and employment records, home and business ownership files. She wants to know what kind of assets a deadbeat parent owns. I believe everything happens for a reason, and now I see why. The reason she started Track X, a collection agency specializing in recovering delinquent child support, is because of her own bad experience with an ex-husband. Since February, Track X has helped 60 custodial parents get what courts say they're owed. Nine times out of ten, it's because they don't want to pay. I have found um, a lot of parents will come to me as far as deadbeats and say, I don't want the money to go to them because I don't like to see them spend it. Hopefully, uh, I'll get some money out of them for the kids, you know. That much money would send all four of them to college. Jean Dills, a single mom of four, is in the office to get help collecting more than $57,000 in back and current child support. He wants to see him, but he don't want to pay. Track X says it has a great track record, collecting 95% of the money owed its clients. The company charges a 25% commission, which for many parents seems pretty reasonable to get child support from a deadbeat child support that oftentimes is eight to ten years behind they're ecstatic 
when they finally find out that um, I, tr I stay with my clients from the beginning of the case to the very end. The end comes in the way of a check or checks and a heartfelt thanks from a mom or dad. Now, why are the, or why aren't the government agencies responsible for making deadbeats responsible doing this kind of work? Well, Rebecca says they are, but oftentimes government agencies are overburdened and just simply don't have the time to do the kind of work that she does, the kind of time to make sure that deadbeats, uh, deadbeat moms and dads do pay up. And Boy, getting, getting that check must really be something. How does she make them finally pay up, Dan? Well, she has the ability or the authority to either garnish their wages or their bank accounts a variety of ways. All right. We'll wish her continued success. Thank you. These puppies are especially bred in California. They come from long lines of seeing eye dogs. Hello. Hello. Joy and Melody Newfeld of Colorado Springs try to guess which one of four German Shepherds in the pen will be theirs for a year. Oh, hi. Hello. This is the one that we think is ours. The girls have already raised two black labs for an organization called Guide Dogs for the Blind. We socialize them and we teach them sit down and stay and all that <laughs> stuff and then we give them up. These are the last hours the girls will have with Baron. He and 22 other dogs are about to be shipped to California for specialized training. About half will eventually become full-time companions for blind people. The happiest part will come first when the puppies are handed out. And then uh, it's a little bit sad when the dogs are returned. They've been with their families for a year. It's a real emotional time. With Baron looking on, Joy and Melody's dad gives them their new puppy. And then a while later, it's time to tell Baron goodbye. That's all we got left of him is the leash. <laughs> they think he has a good chance of making it as a seeing eye dog. They'll miss him, but now they have a new puppy to worry about. Oh, look who we got down here. We got Bronto to replace him, huh? There's Bronto. <laughs> In Gunnison, Dan Dennison, 9 News. Boy, that's tough. Some 4-H families have raised as many as 15 puppies for the seeing eye program. So they've been through this system moving in but that's a ways away now here is a great environmental idea for the 90s there's a company in green river utah that's taking used motor oil and refining it back into gasoline diesel fuel and other usable products in today's earth watch our dan dennison says this unique recycling method is one of the firsts in the nation as oil refineries go the one in green river utah is small but it's based on a big idea we are the only ones that I know of that turns it into gasoline and into diesel. It is used motor oil. Bookcliffe's Energy Corporation's recycling refinery went online a few weeks ago. If we take in 2,000 barrels, we'll market about 2,100 barrels as gasoline and diesel. Um, we'll probably market uh, another 100 barrels as propane butane. They've been working the bugs and kinks out of this prototype refinery, but they know the process of changing old oil into new gas works. We've uh, experimented with some, some gasoline in people's cars, okay. and, uh, um, and it worked well. So we've, we've run a couple of tanks on this, and, and just, just to prove that the gasoline will put a car down the road, and, and it did. The refinery is in Green River because of its central location to major metro areas like Denver, Salt Lake City, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. One Denver oil collection company has already shipped 100,000 gallons of used oil to the plant. It collects 4 to 6 million gallons from a 10-state region every year and says it'll send as much to Utah as a refinery can handle. Okay, this is our light gasoline. This is Dan Dennison, 9 News Earth Watch. The refinery can also make gas from uh, oil derived from plastics and from used tires. Bookcliffe's Energy plans to open other refineries similar to this one around the country. Interesting idea on this week's. More than 100 volunteers spent the day following the footsteps of 14 firefighters who died last July. They started out by carving a trail out of the steep barren ground on Storm King Mountain. Right now, the volunteers are meeting in Glenwood Springs, and Dan Dennison is there. Dan, why did they make a decision to build a trail? 
Well, it's uh, one part of the memorial that they're uh, planning for the firefighters. These people ward got it started this morning. They're building the trail from a rest area just west of Glenwood Springs, just off I-70 to a vantage point up on Storm King Mountain, where hikers can look across at the place where the 14 firefighters died. At the beginning, they gather into groups, the same way firefighters team up for a day on the lines. Does everybody have a water bottle? Yes. yes. Does everybody have gloves? Yes. yes. They'll carry many of the same tools firefighters use, and they'll walk up Storm King Mountain, following the rough paths firefighters built last July. A lot of our, our work's going to be along the ridge line, which will be relatively easy through here. But we'll have to be putting in, does everybody know what a water bar is? They are here to fashion a new trail. When finished, the Storm King Mountain Memorial Trail will be just shy of a mile. It'll take visitors to a promontory where they can look across to the steep slope where 14 men and women died during a firestorm on July 6th. Well, I was impressed by the solemnness of the area, really. When you hit the burned out area, it's, it's pretty real how frightening it must have been that period of time. They're also planning to build a footpath over to the accident site where today smoke jumpers from Idaho planted a rough wooden cross for the family of one of the victims. Each of the volunteers has their own reasons for helping. For 16-year-old Phil Weddick, it's a chance to say thanks. Just felt like helping, just helping out here because of the firefighters. It was close to my house, sort of, in West Glenwood. And it came over the hill and kind of scared my family, so I just felt like helping out. For many of the workers, this is their first trip onto the mountain since the fire. Kind of looks like the backside of the moon. I think it's uh, pretty scary when you realize how steep the slopes are and what they must have held. At the end of the trail, the government plans to put up signs and displays to tell the firefighters' story. But much of it will be told simply by making the hike. Once you get up here and start hiking on these slopes, and, and, uh, and particularly on the way up where it goes through the unburned area, you see how, how thick the vegetation is and how tough it is for them to see and to climb around. Uh, yeah, I think people who, who experience this will have a much better understanding. People who have come from all across Colorado to help build this trail, trail now enjoying a complimentary uh, barbecue. The work continues up on Storm King Mountain tomorrow and then again uh, next weekend, probably both uh, Saturday and Sunday. If you'd like to volunteer, they're still accepting folks to help out, and you can call the Glenwood Springs Resort Chamber Association for more information. Ward, back to you now. This is just one part of a memorial. What else is planned? certainly is. They're going to build a big memorial in Two Rivers Park here in Glenwood Springs. That's going to be dedicated next uh, July. Nine. Load them up with clubs. There really is a science to this. And move them out. Bunch of hackers. It's golfers he speaks of, not Rico and Denny. Two llamas getting caddy duty at Fairway Pines. Oh, look at that. Look at that power. Okay, now has everybody hit? Six of us. This is easy work for llamas. Carrying stuff, including golf bags and clubs, comes naturally. And one llama owning golfer says his caddies put carts to shame. I find they're much preferable because. Uh, uh, they actually whisper the yardage to you, you know, and uh, they have excellent eyesight so they can see your ball even when you can't. Golfers here still have options, rent a cart or a llama. Depends on how, uh, how much fun I wanted to have that day. If I wanted to have a great time, I'd take the llamas. If I just wanted to play golf, I'd take cart. They're cute and sure-footed, and besides putting caddies out of work, groundskeepers should watch out too. Seriously, their soft hooves don't hurt the grass, but they do try to keep them off the greens. Training a llama caddy is a snap. Up steep hills and down steep hills, and it just doesn't bother them at all. And people just really enjoy them. Uh, they're, they're just a real neat animal. Fairway Pines isn't the first course to use llamas, but they seem especially at home here because the course is at 8,000 feet. Llamas love high altitudes and golf. Dan Denison, 9 News. Oh, they're adorable. How about llama potty habits and the lynx? Belinda, our floor director, was wondering, and apparently they're trained to go and establish latrine areas. Very comforting to know. Mike Nelson's in the backyard. Mike, you just have to take it away. There's
Steamboat is rated third best. Skiing Magazine usually ranks only U.S. ski areas, but did a worldwide ranking this year. There are thousands of jobs available this time of year at most of the Colorado ski resorts. Most are only for the winter season, and very few of them pay the big bucks. Dan Dennison is at the Sunlight Ski Area outside Glenwood Springs. Dan, I imagine the number of people they need there doesn't begin to compare with what's needed in Vail and Aspen and places like that. That's exactly right, Ed. This is a small area, so they're only looking to fill uh, 150 or so seasonal positions. As you might imagine, many people look at uh, ski jobs as being somewhat glamorous, but consider the pay. It's only 6 to 13 bucks an hour for most jobs, and it's very expensive to live in ski towns with rents ranging from $500 to $1,500 a month for a two-bedroom apartment, oftentimes five, six, upwards of 10 people sharing that one unit. So that ski job you've had your eye on may not be all that it's cracked up to be. Still, thousands of people want one. No, take it through. The ski slopes are buzzing with activity. At Beaver Creek, the final touches on a new lift. On Vail Mountain, the stringing of the snowmaking guns and hoses. Position three inch two. And in ski area hiring offices, the phones and counters are busy with people looking for work. The Colorado ski industry employs more than 60,000 people during the winter, everything from lift operators and ski instructors to cooks and housekeepers. Top candidates are usually hired on a first-come, first-served basis. So if you're interested, get your application in now, or at least no later than the individual resort's job fair. Nearly all the ski areas have job fairs planned over the next few weeks. Universally, they're looking for the same things in every employee. You know, we're looking for people, people. We're looking for people who enjoy working with, with guests, people who like to come to the outdoors, who like to live in the mountains. Kind of a guest service thing, people that are interested in working with people, because that's the bottom line. And shed that image of all ski workers being late teenage ski bums. Gladys Larrabee is a retired school teacher with two years of ski school experience to put on her application. She and her husband are both looking for jobs in the ski industry. Fun, 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 fun. It can be hard work, but the thousands who take a ski job now, only to lose it next April, agree it's a lot of fun. And at those job fairs, virtually every uh, department that a ski area has is represented. The fair here at Sunlight scheduled for October 30th, the one over in Vail on the 22nd of this month. Most areas have their hiring fairs the last two weekends of October. And Ed, as you might imagine, it's a busy, busy time for the people up in the personnel departments. And there are a few perks available for these folks that take the jobs. There is one big perk that's worth talking about, and I think every ski area that I know of uh, gives their employees a season pass, and, and that's why many people love the jobs. It's worth it for a lot of them, I suppose. Thanks very much, Dan Dennison in Glenwood Springs. And here's Mike Nelson, chomping at the bit, as it were. <laughs>